The C-SPAN networks bring you long-form public affairs programming from the nation's capital and are a public service of your television provider. C-SPAN, created by cable. This week on Q&A, part two of our discussion with former White House Chief of Staff Josh Bolton talking about his duties during the George W. Bush administration. Josh Bolton, in this second part of our discussion about your time as Chief of Staff at the White House, start off by uh, giving us what you saw with the press, the media, and that world. How, how did you view them? Um, usually with some hostility, um, which is I, just it's the natural state of affairs between the White House and the press corps because the because that's that's just the nature of what the press needs to do they need to they need to try to catch the white house out on whatever is going on now we came in with uh in the bush administration with what we thought was a a press court largely inclined to be unfriendly um did did a fair amount of work to try to try to warm up the relationship um, but it was always, it was throughout most of the Bush administration, it was, it was relatively tense. The view inside the White House was that uh, most of the media uh, were uh, either slightly or substantially biased against the administration. And we just felt like we were most of the time swimming upstream. One, one of the good things is that uh, the president, periodically annoyed by it, just, you know, said let it, his advice to everybody was just, you know, let it go off your back. Do, do the best you can with them, but don't, don't get fixated on it. Don't get fixated on it. Don't, uh, don't spend all your time wrought up about how badly the press is treating you. Move on and do your job. How did he decide and who helped him decide who uh, he would grant interviews to? Um, that's the press secretary's job, with the, usually with the under the supervision of the communications director in the structure we had. Um, so that was our communications directors were uh, first Karen Hughes, then Dan Bartlett, then Ed Gillespie, um, and we had a we had a series of uh, of press secretaries, uh, most of whom did a fantastic job: um, Ari Fleischer, Scott McClellan. Um, Tony Snow, Dana Perino, um, and it was it was typically the press secretary's job to um, pick out folks with whom the president would do interviews under what formats on what terms, and you know for for the president's comfort they would uh, they would try to steer things toward people who were more likely to be friendly toward the president, but you couldn't always do that. And you, you know, to, to reach the major markets, you had to, you had to often invite in people whom the White House felt were not favorably inclined to the president. And you just got to take that on. That's part of the job. For those who may have not seen the first uh, part of this interview, uh, you were deputy chief of staff what years in the Bush administration? First two years. And you were chief of staff what years? Last three years, and I was the budget director for the three years in between. So I was, I was there in the White House all eight years. Talking about the media, here is the late Tony Snow talking about how he was selected. Josh and I worked in the first Bush White House, and he had come on my radio show. And we had been talking for some time about getting together. I mean, he's, he's a great guy to work with, and he's somebody I really enjoyed in Bush one. And so we'd finally made this, this date, you know, it was weeks and weeks out. It was on a Friday, I think. And uh, so we finally do it. Well, the day before the lunch, it's announced he's going to be the next White House Chief of Staff. And he ended up doing a sales pitch that I just could not resist, which was, he said, you know, I know the numbers look bad, but, you know, the fundamentals are good in the economy and things are going a certain way in Iraq and so on. And he said, I know you've got a great job, and it's secure, and you're making a lot of money. And, and I can understand why a guy like you uh, just wouldn't want to take the risk or take on the challenges of these sorts of things. But I uh, just like to think about it. Well, at that point, he had totally, you know, he baited the hook and snapped. 
How did he get selected? He, he got selected by me um, because I, uh, I felt that one of the ways in which, as a staff, we were letting the president down was not communicating in an affirmative way about what was going on in the White House. We, uh, we had gotten into a mode, I thought, of, uh, of being responsive and defensive. And you know what? What better way to change that mode than to bring in a you know a fantastic, affirmative character like Tony Snow, who uh, who I I miss and and everybody who ever worked with him miss very much. How long did Tony live once he had gotten into this job? Um, he was. Uh, we brought him in in. The spring of 2006. Um, I think he stayed in the job for about a year and a half um, before he he was starting to get sick again. Um, that he he had been in remission from a very serious cancer, and uh, I, th I think his health was beginning to flag. Um, and so he, he left the White House, my recollection is, about a year before the end of the administration. Um, and uh, um, sadly passed, passed away before the, uh, before the administration ended. Now he was an activist. He was, uh, you know, outspoken and <clears throat> personality came through. Uh, from you looking back at the press secretaries when you were in the White House, is the president better off having somebody who is known in his own right or her own right or having somebody that we don't know and doesn't have an image? Um, I, I, I think the key element is the activist element, that somebody whom the press will respect, likes to be around, whom, whom they feel has the integrity uh, to tell the truth and the access to know the truth. Um, all at all at the same time, uh, Tony had those those attributes in spades. I mean, he was he was just fantastic, and he he really changed the tone with the press. Um, I th I thought his predecessor, um, who, you know, was a, uh, you know a uh, an, an honorable person, um, just had not. Uh, been able to communicate effectively on behalf of the president, and he was he was reasonably well liked by the press, but not not really respected. Who was his by predecessor? The, Scott McClellan, not not really respected by the press, and um, that was when, when the president asked me to be chief of staff. That was um, that was one of the the first jobs that I targeted for a change. And t in your in your clip, Tony mentioned that. Um, that I had set up this lunch with him well before I was announced as chief of staff, but I set up the lunch as soon as I knew I was uh, from the president that I was going to be the chief of staff. Um, you know, there was a there was a w couple of weeks lag between uh, when the president made the decision and when we were actually announced, and so he was he was top of my target list. To uh, to try to get him into the into the White House, and I, I'm uh, I'm very glad we did, and I think everybody who worked with him is glad we did. As you know, Scott McClellan wrote a book that was very critical of the Bush administration. Why did he do that, in your opinion? I don't know. That's that's always been a mystery to me. We we those of us inside the Bush operation, who had worked with Scott for many years, uh, always considered uh, one of his and maybe his principal attribute. To be loyalty, and um, was um, he fired? Yes, I, I fired him, and um, and he he hasn't made any bones about that. I I haven't made any bones about that. Now we we tried to do it in as gentle uh, and respectful a way as possible because none of us, at least at the time, had any bad feelings towards Scott. We just didn't think he was doing the job that the president needed, and uh, so we. Uh, we made it as um, as respectful and easy as possible on uh, on him. Um, I, you know, I offered him however he wanted to handle it, whatever time frame. Uh, the president even went out when when we announced his departure. The president even went out to the sticks with him, and they had sort of an emotional 
uh, set of farewell comments. Um, so it's, I mean, it's the kind of thing that's, that's hard when you're chief of staff to do because um, Scott was a friend and he was someone I, who I knew had given many years of his life and loyal service to the president. I just didn't think he was doing a good job for the president. We needed a different character at that time. We needed a character like Tony Snow. Talk about firing for a minute, because in the I've got George Bush uh, 43's book here, and he talks some about the John Sununu firing when he was his father's chief of staff. Uh, and, and, and from your perspective, what did George W. do with John Sununu? And if he fired him, why didn't the president fire him? Interesting question. I don't I don't know that story uh, as well because um, I, w- I wasn't around for that, uh, for the episode in 41's administration when he, uh, when he asked John Sununu to step down as his chief of staff. But um, he did, uh, uh, according by all accounts, he did ask both uh, 43, his son, and his then deputy chief of staff, Andy Card, to, to deliver the message to uh, to John Sununu, who's a um, very able man and I think served with distinction, but but again, the president decided was not right for that moment in his presidency. Um, why did why did forty one ask other people to deliver the uh, the news? I I'm not really sure that that was certainly not forty three style. Um, one of the one of the uh, amusing bits of fallout from that earlier episode was, though, that um, Bush 43's ch- first chief of staff was Andy Card, served uh, longer than any chief of staff in modern history. The only, only chief of staff that served longer was Sherman Adams, uh, Eisenhower's chief of staff. Um, but uh, in, the, uh, in the first two years of the Bush 43 White House, I was Andy Card's deputy. In other words, I was in the position to Andy that Andy had been in with respect to Sununu. And so about every week or so, Andy would come into my office and say, uh, you know, how am I doing? Uh, You know, President President want to get rid of me? Because if he does, you know, you just let me know I'm I'm gone. So Andy Andy came at it with the with the perspective of uh, of somebody who had had to deliver the news to his then boss. that that was not 43 style. I mean, he was uh, he was very warm and connected in a family way with with all of his staff. Um, he was pretty tough-minded at the same time about you know what the needs of the White House and the presidency were. So, you know, when I came to him and said, "I think we need to replace Scott McClellan," he didn't. I mean, he was sad about it. He'd considered Scott a, a good friend for many years, uh, but he didn't hesitate. Um, he was uh, he was very warm with Scott, wanted to be supportive, called Scott's wife um, to give her reassurance about his good feelings about Scott. Um, but on the on the merits of the case, he didn't he didn't hesitate at all. Now it was my job to fire Scott, but um, it was it was not the kind of decision from which. 43 would shrink at all. Did you have to fire anybody else? Yes. You want to tell us who? Not really. <laughs> you may be able to squeeze it out of me, Brian, but uh, if, we can, if we can avoid it, I, I would. I, I will say that um, it, I found that to be one of the toughest parts of the job um, because um, it's, uh, I mean, that's when it gets personal. And, and often with people like Scott, who I knew had given a lot in public service, and uh, the reward you give them shouldn't be a, a, an abrupt pink slip. But these are, you know, the, the jobs inside the White House, there aren't many more important jobs on the planet. And you, you gotta fill them with the best possible people at every moment. What was your view, speaking of the media, of the wrangle, I don't know what word you want to use, over Karl Rove and Valerie Plame and her husband 
and the yellow cake and Bob Novak and who leaked the story and all that. How did you see it where you were sitting and what role did you play in that? Um, I, I, I had very little role um, in the in the in the underlying activity or or even the fallout from it because I was the budget director at the time kind of kind of removed from those uh, those sorts of um, political considerations and activities um, but it but it, you you couldn't fail if you sat at the senior staff table in the Bush administration in those years um, you couldn't fail to be affected by it and and to have a lot of sympathy for the folks that were that were going through a, um, a, a very difficult um, uh, investigation that um, I, uh, I think was, um, I'm, I'm trying to pick a, a polite word, but ill-conceived Ill at best. Um, you know, there, there had been the it's an incredibly complicated story, um, but it, trying to boil it down to, to some of its basic elements, um, there, uh, I've, I've even forgotten the name of Valerie Plame's husband. Joe uh, Wilson. Joe Wilson. Uh, Joe Wilson had, had published an article saying that he had been sent to, uh, to investigate some of the allegations about Saddam Hussein having sought yellow cake from uh, Niger and uh, that he had reported back that it just wasn't so. Um, and this was, his, his uh, op-ed was intended to undermine the credibility of the Vice President and the administration in, in asserting that there was evidence of this and he was he was asserting in, in contra that he had been asked by these same people to look and he had told them no. Um, the, the response out of the White House to this was to, uh, was not, I don't believe, intended to attack Joe Wilson personally, but was to undermine the credibility of what he was saying, um, in part by saying, look, we didn't send him. He was, he was sent by the agency, and in particular, at the suggestion of his wife, who worked at the agency. So there was a, there was a substantive credibility reason to out the wife, and I don't think it was intentional. Um, and it appeared in a Bob Novak column that the, the revelation of the wife having been um, at, the, at the CIA and the, uh, as it turned out, the person who had leaked that information to Bob Novak was the Deputy Secretary of State who... Dick Armitage. Dick Armitage, who in the course of the uh, investigation, Rich, you know, fessed up to it and said, yeah, I, I did that, a, you know, mistake. Uh, didn't realize I was revealing any classified information. And yet, the special prosecutor's investigation went on at the White House, even though they knew what the source of the leak was, they decided that they would just keep digging at the White House, and what they were basically doing was interviewing people in the hopes of catching them in some kind of perjury trap, um, which is how they eventually caught Scooter. Lee. How much involved did the president get in something like that? Very, very limited, if at all. I mean, he you know especially once there was a special prosecutor appointed he he stepped back and and the president himself um, as you'll see from both his memoir and from the vice president's memoir the president himself was um, uh, only very tangentially in, involved in any of that i mean it, it was you know in a way it was it was kind of a trivial episode that because of the investigation and then the prosecution blew up into a big deal. Do you, rem back to the media for a minute, do you, do you remember any interview that the president didn't like and you heard from him? Gosh, I have, I have vivid memories of him not liking interviews um, and, I, and I, 
I have trouble coming up with speci with a specific one, which I probably wouldn't wouldn't highlight for you anyway. But yeah, there were there were plenty of occasions. Well, I, where, I'll give you one uh, yeah. that I remember: Tim Russert in the Oval Office. Yeah, which was uh, you know probing. Yeah. I mean, the, the, you know, the president didn't mind tough questions, but he he did mind the same question being asked repeatedly, uh, in in in, a, in order to suggest that the answer had been insufficient. You did know, you, you ever could, hear him say, "I'll never have that person interview me again"? And, and I, what I'm getting at is here the control that you have in the White House of, we've just been through this a couple of weeks ago yeah. with uh, the president, who they let in and who they don't let in. Yeah. Um, I don't recall hearing him say, I'll never talk to that person again, but um, you can be darn sure that the next time the press secretary came forward and said, how about Tim Russert, the president would say, no, he's, you know, he's, it's, it's not a serious substantive interview. He's, he's looking to score points. Sorry. What, what did you think of the daily briefings? And if you had your druthers, would you keep them up and would you keep them televised? The, the daily the, press, uh, the press secretaries, yes. Yeah, I, I, I thought you might have been talking about the daily intelligence no. briefing, but the, the, the press secretary briefings, yeah, I'd keep them up. I'd keep them televised. Um, I mean, they're, they, they've unfortunately turned into a little bit of theater, but um, so be it. It's part of the job. You know, we, you know in, the, in the, the Bush White House uh, and in the, in the view that I think a lot of us shared, uh, we're all for transparency. You know, we're all for... Uh, making sure that the public is informed about what the th what the thinking is, um, it's it's just that so often it becomes a, it becomes theater and gotcha, and that and that's what that's certainly what uh, George W. Bush objected to. He never he never minded a tough question. He liked a tough question. He just didn't like uh, gotcha and theater. I don't know if you're involved in this, but why did he put the clamps on the release of archival material for both his father? Uh, and himself put it, push it down the road a number of years when he got in there. I don't know. I don't know. I don't. Um, I don't. I don't remember what the, the thinking that went into that uh, that decision. I want to show you uh, t two clips. I want to show you the early George Bush in 1988 when he was campaigning for his father, and get your re reaction to this because you saw him in later years, and then show you the, one of the last uh, interviews that he did. You'll see me going to talk to um, the people of the community through the media about George Bush, but also see us talking to our people in the trenches. You win politics by attracting good people who are willing to work for you. And the message is simple. We need you and we love you. And, and we're going to fight with you together. A any quick reaction? Yeah, he looks like a kid. Well. In his book, he, here's a quote from him that wasn't for this campaign in 88, it was the one in 92 when he was running against Bill Clinton. He said, um, instead I unleashed. I told the reporters I thought their stories were biased. My tone was harsh and I was rude. It was not my only angry blur to the campaign. I had developed a reputation in the press corps as a hothead and I deserved it. What the press did not understand was that my outbursts were driven by love, not politics. You know, he uh, it, uh, that sentiment got reflected many times while he was president. That he would he would often recall his time of having been a president's son, and say that when the you know when the press was tough, uh, it's much harder to take that when you're a son or a spouse than it is when you're actually the president. And and this that would be him in the mode of just calming people down a little bit about an unfair assault in the press. Um, he would uh, he would say, "Look, I'm okay. Um, I know it's tougher on you, and it, it was tough on his wife. Often, he'd say, I've been there. It's tougher on you than it is on me.'" Let's move 20 years later at the end of his presidency and the room, the dining room right off the uh, state dining room. I was at work every morning at 6.45. In other words, I believe that it's very important for someone running a complex organization to be disciplined in, in, in his behavior. And uh, so if a meeting were to start at 8 o'clock, that meant 8. I remember early on, uh, I think it was Carl Rove, wandered into a meeting late. 
And it was fortunate it was Carl because uh, he was, you know, had big standing in our administration. He said, don't be late again. And all the people in the meeting were like, man, this guy means it if he's telling that to Carl Rove. And so our meeting started on time, they ended on time. And I think it's discipline inside an organization is very important in order to get uh, good advice. How did he t deal with that with you and the way you ran the day-to-day -day operation? Um, well, by, by the time I became chief of staff, that remember that was f five full years into the administration, uh, it was pretty well established. If you, if you were hanging around George W. Bush, you were going to run on time. Um, I got my first lesson in it uh, when during the campaign uh, when we were uh, we were in Boston for one of the presidential debates, and the uh, you know we were all leaving in the motorcade for the uh, for the debate setting, and and then Governor Bush just decided he didn't want to you know be risky on time or anything. We're, he's going to leave ten minutes early, and so he just got into the motorcade and left. And I remember being able to see the motorcade out of my hotel room uh, taken off and. You know, just left me behind. I, I was the policy director of the campaign. Probably would have been a good idea to have me at the uh, at the debate side. I eventually got there for the spin room afterwards, which I guess was the important part. Um, but that that story was everybody has a story like that, which is uh, if it involves George W. Bush, if you if you show up ten minutes early for the meeting, you're about right. If you show up five minutes early, you're on time, and if you show up on on time the likelihood is the meeting will already have started. How often did he talk to other presidents, earlier presidents, when he was in the Oval Office? Um, you know, probably not that often. And, and my guess is that every president says they're going to stay in touch and consult and so on. Um, and, I, and I think they find a certain comfort in talking to other people who've held the office. Uh, but the reality is they can't help very much if you're not, if you're not really present and if you don't really have all of the information and all of the factors on a tough decision there's no, there's not much that somebody who isn't involved can really do to be helpful so apart from his dad with whom he spoke often but I think rarely about business um, I don't I don't think President Bush talked all that often with his predecessors he enjoyed talking with uh, President Clinton, especially in the later years of his presidency. And in particular, I remember uh, during the 2008 campaign when, um, by, by political necessity, President Bush was sidelined. I mean, in, in effect, we had both the Democratic and the Republican candidate running against the incumbent. Um, and Bush understood that he didn't he didn't have any any bitterness or complaint, um, but it, I think it was fr just frustrating for him to be, who you know having been actively engaged in political campaigns most of his adult life, to be on the sidelines. And he's a political pro; he loves a good campaign. So especially during the '08 campaign, he would he would peri periodically call up uh, 42 President Clinton, and just talk politics with him. And and they they both seem to enjoy it, and they, they they've sustained a a, a good personal relationship uh, into their post presidencies. Did he ever chew you out for anything? Sure, all the time. Uh, I mean, it, you know, in in his own way, he's not he's not a mean guy. He's a, he's a tough guy, but he's he's I, I don't know what the opposite of mean is, but. But he's the opposite of it. Um, he's he's the kind of guy that you know when when he chews you out, you it's for a purpose, and you know it's not personal, and uh, you, you know you know he still supports you and cares for you. So he's a, he's a very good boss in that respect. I'll tell you though the the one thing that was sure to get you chewed out, and it's uh, um, it's a reflection of the the discipline of punctuality that. Um, that the president was emphasizing in the clip you just ran. The one sure way as chief of staff for anybody near him to get chewed out was to put him in a position where he was necessarily late. Uh, he, he just considered that the, the greatest discourtesy and arrogance to other people. Um, and so if you put him in a position where 
uh, he ended up being late, you 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 would you would hear about it, and it's one reason why we worked very hard to make sure that 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 almost never happened. In fact, in fact, the only the only circumstance where I remember President Bush regularly running late um, was when he would have meetings with families of the fallen. That that was about the only thing where he wouldn't insist on. You know, we said it was going to be a thirty-minute meeting. It's going to it's going to take twenty-nine minutes, and we would we would schedule ample time for him to visit with the families, but. You know, if they wanted to talk, if they wanted to share remembrances of the um, of the soldier they lost, um, he was going to stay there with them uh, for as long as he thought uh, they needed. He'd he'd often weep with them, um, and that those segments, which we which we usually did at the end of a visit to a, a, any city around the U.S. It, it, the way it worked is that. If the president was going out to, uh, to you know, Chicago or Des Moines or any place, uh, we would get the Pentagon to send us the names of the families of the fallen within a certain radius of the place we were visiting, and we'd extend invitations for them to come visit with the president when his schedule was done. We we learned early on that you couldn't do it at the front of his schedule. Um, both because of the time factor and because it was pretty emotional, and it was often hard for him to then switch gears back to a, a rousing education event. Did you ever have a moment when he was visiting with the fallen where the person he was talking to got hostile toward him? Yes. Um, it didn't happen often, but it, it happened um, regularly w with respect to the family of the fallen, families of the fallen. and. Um, and the the president handled it well. I mean, he that was one reason he was doing those meetings is that he he felt like it was his responsibility to hear from people uh, who's uh, from the the folks who had made the ultimate sacrifice that they had sacrificed a family member, and uh, he thought he should hear from them. Now, o overwhelmingly, people were very supportive, and uh, the message, at least in the sessions that I saw, most commonly was. You know, my husband, my son, uh, my wife uh, loved their job and loved serving their country, um, and and were committed to the cause on which you sent them. Please don't let them die in vain. What would you do, and what would be done, <clears throat> if somebody was hostile? Did anybody ever have to get in the middle of all that? I never saw that episode. I mean, the, the president is never more than a few feet away from a Secret Service agent, so I don't. I don't think there was ever. I mean, you, you'd never put the president in, in a in a situation of physical danger. But I. But even where where people were angry, and you know, you can understand when somebody's lost a loved one, and they, you know, uh, they. They're in grief and they don't understand why it happened, and they and they have somebody to blame, because the guy that sent their loved one into into harm's way is sitting right in front of them. Um, you can you can see where they, uh, or it's not a surprise that folks would get hostile. And but there, I don't think there was ever a situation where he was in physical danger. The surprise to me was how rarely that happened. That the that the messages were usually those of of warmth and support. We see presidents all the time meeting with foreign leaders. I've always wanted to ask, and I've never have. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I'll ask you. How often, from your experience, when President Bush, George W. Bush, would meet with a foreign leader, did the foreign leader speak English? Uh, pretty often, pretty often. Does, but some does of them. Putin speak English? No. I mean, he speaks a little, but no, they would they would have to speak through interpreters. But they they developed a pretty good rapport. Even it, it's much. It, <laughs> this was surprising to me. I I would have thought that it would be really hard to develop any kind of rapport through an interpreter. And uh, in many cases, uh, President Bush did manage. And one of those cases being with Putin, who in I mean increasingly they were at loggerheads substantively, and and Bush was never gentle. 
with, uh, with Putin in their conversations. He was always friendly, always respectful, but he would, he would come right to the point, which created some difficult conversations between them. But they had, a, they had a good personal rapport, even having to go through an interpreter. There were, there were a number of leaders who you know, spoke pretty good English, but still always had an interpreter present. One, Can you remember one? Yeah, um, Angela Merkel, with whom President Bush had a great relationship. She's, uh, she's uh, terrific in, you know, in private as well as public. Yeah, very thoughtful, smart, um, and a genuine kind of person in, in much the same way that President Bush is. Um, so they developed a real rapport. Uh, her English is very good, but not perfect. And so she always, when they would talk, or when they did video conversations, which they did every, every few weeks while during the time I was chief of staff, um, she would always have an interpreter with her. And, but the interpreter never really had much to do except when uh, Chancellor Merkel would get caught on a word. Where did they do the video conversations? In the Situation Room. And, and President Bush did them during my tenure. He did them regularly with uh, Tony Blair and then Gordon Brown. Uh, and with Angela Merkel, um, and with Prime Minister Maliki of Iraq, um, as well as separately with um, our uh, military commander and ambassador in Baghdad. Did Prime Minister Maliki speak English? No. No. And, and there really was hard, I think, to establish much personal rapport. I think they, they both made a good effort at it. but. Um, the, the, the distance both in, in language and culture is, is pretty hard to bridge under those circumstances. When we get into an international <clears throat> situation uh, and you hear the president has been talking with foreign leaders, what's the process? Um, well, the kind of thing I described is real talking, is that, uh, that President Bush would, you know, just, it would just be part of the schedule that he wanted to talk to, 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 especially during the, you know, the darkest days of the Iraq War, he would just want to talk with Tony Blair periodically. And so, that's real talking because there there might be a couple of agenda items that the staff would have scripted out, but for the most part, they're just sharing their views and anxieties and hopes, giving each other support, ideas and so on. So it's, those were real conversations and they often lasted 30, 45 minutes. The more typical conversation when you hear a, a, you know, the news say, and President X spoke with Prime Minister X, it's, uh, it's a fairly scripted event and the, it's, you know, it's set up a day or two, at least a day or two in advance. Um, somebody briefs the President on what it is that if it's if it's a U.S. initiated call, here's what here's what we want to want to say to this person, and what we want to get out of them, um, and the you know the prime minister of whatever is getting a similar briefing on the other end. So they, it's usually a fairly scripted call um, that has the the substantive purpose of underscoring a message, which you know, can be delivered through subordinates and probably has been, but when the, when the president himself does it, it, it comes with much extra force, and it has the political and public relations benefit of having been done leader to leader. So you, could, you, can, that, you can say that it was done that way. Well, let's say there's a, <clears throat> not an emergency, but things have to move fast, and he needs to talk to somebody like a, a President Putin how do you put it together fast, and where do you get the interpreter? Um, there, there are uh, State Department interpreters for every language on call at all times. At all times. Uh, yeah, and so there. I mean, there. The the president had his favorites. You know, he had his favorite in in Russian language, his favorite in Spanish, and you know, he he might even ask for that particular interpreter, <clears throat> who sometimes play a substantive role. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, but they, you know, they live in the D.C. area. They're on call. If you're traveling to that country, you're bringing interpreters with you, who you whom you know and you trust, um, usually. And uh, so you can, uh, you know, 
an hour or less is is, is the time frame. So um, you mean as as we sit here, there's somebody in all those languages on call at the State Department? Yeah, sure. Um, and uh, and and I hope the State Department makes sure, especially in in you know times of international tension like this, that they they always have an expert in every important language who's you know, if not in the office, by their phone, ready to ready to jump in when needed, um, because those things do happen quickly. You you do have to be able to to make that call quickly. Now, for the um, uh, talking about the the substantive role that interpreters sometimes play, um, I did I did see occasions where a particularly good interpreter won't just be interpreting the words that the uh, that the other leader is saying is that he will, at a break or beforehand, maybe after, say something to the president about um, he was really mad. You know, you, it, it's hard to tell in another language, but say he's really upset. He's, you know, he's, I think he's thinking of walking out or something like that. Often very good intelligence for the president who. Uh, President Bush has you know, great emotional intelligence, really very keen perceptions about what somebody else is thinking and feeling at that moment. But that's often hard to pick up in a different language. And there were some key interpreters. Um, I'm thinking of one in particular who did a lot of Arab language interpretation for the president, who was often telling him more than the exact words that the, uh, the other leader was saying. How much preparation and how does it work when he goes to meet with a foreign leader, there's a dinner, uh, maybe somebody he's never met before? How, does, how long does that process take and who does it? Uh, it's, it's often a pretty elaborate process. Um, it's coordinated by the National Security Council staff um, where there is a, there's a director or a senior director for every region and a director for every country. Um, but they will be drawing briefing papers and background information from uh, the State Department, from the Defense Department, from all of the relevant agencies of government um, to put into briefing materials for the president. And so when the president went off on a foreign trip, let's say he's off to the G20 where it's jam-packed with uh, world leaders, many of whom the president will sit down with in a one-on-one -on -one at, the, at the margins of the meeting. The, the real guts of a, of a meeting like a G8 or a G20 is often not what happens around the table, but the one-on-ones that happen um, around that meeting. So the president will take off on Air Force One with a briefing book that's this fat with materials about each of them. President Bush was studious about it. He, I, I very rarely uh, went to a meeting with him where he had not read the briefing materials. Um, staff knew not to, not to overload him because they knew the book was going to be this big. And even though you think whatever country you're writing about is the most important one, you've got to be respectful of the president's time. Um, but he actually read those briefing papers, often ignored them, you know, they were often asking him to raise 10 issues, and he knew better than to try to raise 10 issues with Prime Minister Putin at that moment, or President Putin, whichever job he was in, um, at that moment. So he, he exercised a fair amount of independent judgment about what issues to raise and how to raise them. But he got, he got very detailed briefing materials on every meeting going forward, and he would rarely sit down with a world leader without uh, having in mind, here are the top two or three things I want to communicate and, and here are the top two or three things I want to get from this other world leader. Who had direct access to him? Who could go into the Oval Office? Uh, and and who, who managed, who had access by phone and who, who could go through the door? We were never formal about that. Um, as a procedural matter, Generally, with the, with the exception of a select few, if you want to see the president, you need the approval of the chief of staff. And so if some random person called up and said, I want to see the president, um, the call would come down to me. 
and I'd, I'd have to determine whether it was something even to raise with the president or, or send off to somebody else. What if it was a cabinet officer? Cabinet officer would come through me as chief of staff. Uh, they would say, I'd, I'd like to visit with the president. And uh, What if he doesn't want to visit? Uh, I didn't have a circumstance where the president ever said no. Uh, there, there may have been circum there, there were certainly circumstances where I would say um, not a good time, or um, they would tell me what they're they're coming in about, and I would say, can we have one meeting before you visit with the president? Because I think we can tee this up better, maybe even resolve it short of the president. Um, so. Um, that's that's the chief of staff's job because the it, it's, I don't know if it's the most important function of the chief of staff, but you've you, you you've got to really husband the most precious resource that the White House have has, which is the president's time. But what about the people right around him? Who got in while you were there? Um, you mean just kind of wander in if they happen to be walking past the Oval Office? And I mean, who stick had their the direct in? access to the? Like the Carl Roves and the Condi Rices and people like that. You just named that it. it. Yeah, and uh, well, Steve Hadley when he was National Security Advisor. What about the press secretary? Um, yes, press secretary would wander in, but very rarely would anyone wander in without alerting the chief of staff. That's that's one of the functions of the chief of staff is to know everything that anybody tells the president, and more importantly, anything the president says back. So, uh, you know, Carl might wander in to talk, you know, to gossip a little bit about politics or something. They were very close. Um, and that's not necessarily something where either Carl or the president would say, you know, get the chief down here for that. Uh, but most other conversations, including where the press secretary was going in, um, either the press secretary or the president's assistant would call me and say, so-and-so was just about to go in. Um, and I'd usually, I'd, if I didn't happen to be anywhere near the o, in the, if I didn't happen to be around the Oval Office at that moment, I'd, you know, walk the hundred paces down from my office just to be there for that conversation. After we finished our first conversation, I told you that I wanted to ask you about the OMB clearance process, and you looked at me like I was the wonk of uh, the century. You, you are the wonk of the century. I don't feel like a wonk, but I, I want to bring it up because I don't think anybody understands it. Uh, and, I, and it seems to me as an outsider looking in, it's a very powerful place to be if you're the OMB director, which you were. And if somebody in the cabinet or somebody in an agency wants to start a piece of legislation and they come, they have to t come to the OMB clearance process, at least that's where it used to be. It, it, was that the case when you were there? And what kind of power does the OMB director have with getting a piece of legislation all the way through the president up to introduced on the Hill? Yes, it was the case. And it's more extreme even than you just described because it's not just if a cabinet officer wants to propose a piece of legislation. If a cabinet officer even just wants to comment on a somebody else's piece of legislation, that document has to come through the clearance process at OMB. Now it's it's um, it's less daunting than I think you just made it sound, um, and it makes it makes perfect sense. I mean, the the government, the executive branch of government, is vast. There's literally millions of employees, dozens of of departments and agencies, and uh, through through no f you know no no malice on the part of a cabinet officer, they, they may have a point of view that is not shared by other people in the government, and the government trips up badly when it doesn't send a consistent message to the Hill. So that process at OMB exists to make sure that there is a consistency of policy and statements. Um, I think most people would be surprised at how how small the policy apparatus of the White House is. You know, it's the, the people who have policy responsibility on the White House staff itself is, you know, only a few dozen in domestic and economic policy, somewhat larger on the NSC staff, but it's not, it's not fast. Um, and so th those people, those few dozen people, don't have the resources to monitor everything that every part of government is doing at any one time. OMB is a big professional agency within the White House, um, but it's 500 
uh, really high quality experienced employees, 475 of whom are career employees who are used to the process, who know, you know, who know the issues going back a long way. Um, don't change with administrations and you know don't don't come and go with the political winds and having them as the as the centerpiece uh, as the fulcrum of government to coordinate all these is issues makes great sense and I think most cabinet officers would say wasn't a wasn't a big impediment in some cases was a help in getting their views expressed but it seems that if you look back over what we've talked about you were OMB director which definitely is a spot I assume you could influence the flow of a lot of serious legislation sure. you were chief of staff and you're in a position where you people get into the Oval Office or don't based on whether you say so and you go back to the fact you hired Tony Snow once you got in there as the press secretary and you were responsible for Hank Paulson um, did you feel all of that responsibility in those different jobs? And when you walked out of there at the end of the term, was it, thank goodness it's over, or gee, that was really fun because I had all that power? Um, neither one of those. Neither one of those. Um, I, uh, I, w I was well aware every day of the responsibilities I had as deputy chief of staff, as budget, especially as budget director, especially as chief of staff. So that I was cognizant of that every day, um, but the the burden did not seem heavy to me at at the time. It just seemed part of my job, and um, I think one of the reasons is that we were blessed in the Bush White House of having a very supportive team environment. There was very little internecine struggle. There was very little fragging going on inside the Bush White House. And that was a tone set from the top. And so if you're going, if you're going into that kind of circumstance with a lot of really good supportive people around you, the burdens that are coming in from the outside weigh a lot less. But as you look, at that job from outside now, and somebody would come to you and say, what do you recommend I'm gonna be the chief of staff to change things to make it work better, what would you say? Well, uh, you mean for the present administration or no, just, just, just in just general, generically? I mean, what would your advice be if you were gonna write a book, advice to the next chief advice of staff? To the chief, advice to the generic chief of staff. Yes. Um, I, I would say first, make sure you're in charge, and, and President Bush, uh, gave me that mantle of authority at the outset, which is, which is critical. I mean, the, there's a lot of competing forces in a White House, and there are the, a lot of competing interests, a lot of differing views, a lot of big personalities with a lot of responsibility themselves. Um, and would you say a lot of egos? Yeah, sure. I mean, that, uh, that goes with the, the kind of high-quality people that should be in jobs like cabinet jobs is that there's often, I mean, they, those folks uh, usually are the best of their kind and that that often comes with a with a commensurate ego. And so you, the, the chief of staff for the benefit of the president needs to be fully empowered and in charge. Not necessarily to make the decisions, the big decisions belong to the president, um, but to to run the process that's going to make it possible for the president to make good decisions based on the, the advice of all of all these other people and in particular to preserve the ability of the president to make the decisions so that's number one number two in in part to keep uh, to be sure that the president is in fact the one making the decisions the advice I've I've given now to uh, several of my successors is try to keep the non-presidential issues away from him. That is, try to try to promote consensus, try to be a catalyst for making the advisors in the cabinet agree on a on a path um, on issues that are not truly presidential, and on issues that are presidential, do the reverse. That is, trigger. And, and draw out the disagreement. Because what happens often when people come into the Oval Office 
is they, they shave the edges off of their argument. They don't want to be bringing a tough decision to the president. They don't want to be, appear to be argumentative or a bad colleague for, the, for their counterpart on the other side of the cabinet table. And so the president often gets um, shaved advice with sort of rounded edges. And I think that disserves the president. And really, only the chief of staff can intervene and say, Mr. President, this person is, has a stronger disagreement than they're, they're letting on. And I want to encourage you to make the full argument that I heard, I heard you make in the, in the pre-meeting that we had a little while ago. So be, as a chief of staff, be a fomenter of vigorous disagreement in front of the president. Because if you don't do that, you're denying the president the opportunity to make the most important decisions. Why have you not written a book? And did you ever think about doing that? Uh, you know, I never seriously thought about it. Um, I, don't, um, I don't write easily. I don't, um, I find that many books that are written by folks like me tend to be self-justifications or score settling. Um, by the way, that's not true of several of the books that have come out of the Bush administration, which, uh, which I admire. Um, and so I've, I've, I've always felt like, you know, I don't, uh, I don't really have that much to contribute in a book, as, especially when you have an opportunity to talk with Brian Lamb. Do, do, uh, did you keep a diary? No, and and you have to be very cautious about that when you're in the uh, when you're in a senior government role because um, it's a bit of a murky area. But any anything you commit to writing um, that you at least that you share with anyone else um, becomes an official record of the executive office of the president and. Uh, it, you lose it as your own property, and it becomes the property of the federal government, and it becomes maybe discoverable in litigation, certainly requestable by a congressional committee, and there's, there's probably stuff that if you were writing an honest diary, you wouldn't want to put down, in, that, that you would want in the diary uh, as a memory of what happened, but that you wouldn't want to be immediately disclosed in a congressional hearing. From your knowledge, has President Obama talked very often with President Bush? Um, not very often, is my sense. You know, they they have a they have a cordial relationship and a respectful one, um, but um, uh, for reasons that I described earlier, I don't. You know, it's it's hard for a former president to be of much really useful substantive advice because they're not they're not in the flow of all the information. So I think President Obama has called President Bush periodically um, at at important moments, you know, when they uh, uh, when they were about to take down Osama bin Laden, that kind of thing. Um, but I don't. But it's. But it hasn't been a, uh, a a wide flow of communication. And but I don't. But I don't think that reflects at all a lack of uh, a lack of cordiality or a lack of respect. If if anything, you know, President Bush has said that his uh, admirable reticence in speaking out publicly is is partly out of appreciation for the tough job that the president faces. Before we uh, close this down, uh, this is our second of two hours, part two. Um, born in Washington, D.C., went to St. Albans here, uh, same school that Al Gore went to and a bunch of other people. Went to Princeton, got your law degree at Stanford, used to be deputy chief of staff, worked in the trade office for a while, uh, OMB director, Chief of Staff from 2006 to 2009. Last thing, what are you doing now? Um, I have my own consulting firm here in D.C. Um, and immediately after government service, I went off and taught for two years at my alma mater, Princeton, which was a fabulous experience. And I think a good way to, to come out of government service uh, is, to, is to try to teach about it. It, it helps both the, the students and the teacher. Uh, consolidate what they knew. Um, but now I have a, a small consulting firm that back here in DC that provides me the luxury of getting paid to uh, think about and talk about some of the same issues that I thought were 
so interesting during a very privileged government career. We're out of time, but will you ever serve in government again? I don't expect to, but um, it's, it is a fantastic privilege, and um, who knows? Thank you, Josh Bolton. Thank you. For free transcripts or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at qnda.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts. Next, British Prime...